thank you uh, for inviting me and for that nice introduction. And I'm very sorry that you're not going to be learning about how to decode consciousness today, because I cannot code consciousness, but I can tell you about the social brain. And that's what I'm going to do. So firstly, I'm going to talk a bit about what I mean by the social brain. And I'm then going to talk about um, how social interaction appears to be critical in early development. I will talk about some recent research on how the social brain changes both in structure and function during the period of adolescence in humans. I will talk finally about how perspective taking continues to develop late in adolescence. And to wrap up, I will try to draw out some implications of this research for education. Okay, so what do I mean by the social brain? So I will show you an image that I think really nicely illustrates two aspects of how your social brain works. Okay, so what this image shows, some of you might recognize this photograph, is Michael Owen just having missed a goal for Liverpool. And the first aspect of the social brain that this picture really nicely illustrates is how automatic and instinctive social emotional responses are. So within a split second of Michael Owen having missed this goal, everyone is doing the same thing with their faces and the same thing with their arms. Even Michael Owen, as he slides along the ground, is doing the same thing with his arms and presumably has a similar facial expression. And the only person who isn't is this guy up here. <laughs> And he's making an equally recognizable social emotional response. The second aspect of the social brain that this picture nicely illustrates, and the aspect that my research is most focused on, is how good we are at reading other people's social emotional gestures and body language. So you don't have to ask any of these people how they're feeling. You have a very good idea just from observing their facial expressions and their bodily gestures, what is going on in their minds, how they're thinking, what they're thinking, and how they're feeling at this precise moment in time. Indeed, humans are exquisitely social. There's even evidence that we are born with some very basic social abilities, like, for example, the ability to detect faces. So there's a lot of evidence now that if you show newborn babies different stimuli, so faces or objects, and in this case, upright faces and inverted faces, so you can see that down at the bottom, so either upright cartoons of faces or upside down cartoons or real photographs of faces and upside down photos of faces, and you record how long newborn babies within a few hours of being born look at each uh, stimulus, you find that they prefer, so they look longer at both cartoon faces and photographs of faces compared to upside down faces. They seem to prefer to look at real or cartoon face-like shapes. Similarly, very young babies will imitate facial expressions. So this is uh, research, old research by Andrew Meltzoff, who um, set his lab up in a maternity ward and uh, recorded whether very, very young babies within a few days of being born will imitate facial expression. And as you can see here, babies tend to, after a while, imitate things like tongue protrusion and various other facial expressions. So we're born with some very basic social abilities, but of course social cognition becomes much more sophisticated over the first few months and years of life. And that's partly due to the massive amount of brain development that goes on in the first few weeks and months and years of life, depending on the brain region and the species of animal. So one of the uh, brain developmental mechanisms that I'm going to focus on today is called synaptic reorganization. So here you have a diagram of a kind of typical brain cell. Your brain is made up of these cells amongst others, but these are the most common, called neurons. Uh, so you have the cell body and the axon along which electrical signals pass. And electrical signals are communicated via synapses or connections between uh, one neuron and other neurons in the environment. Um, so synaps synapses become reorganized starting from very early on after conception in all brain regions. Initially, they undergo a period of synaptogenesis, that is the generation of new synapses. So sy the number of synapses massively multiplies in the first few weeks and months of life. So this is a diagram from uh, the cortex of a of, um, human post-mortem brain tissue, uh, starting from 
a newborn baby going up to six months. And what you can see here is that the number of cells, the number of neurons, stays more or less stable. And it's really the number of connections. You can see these uh, dendrites. They look like branches of trees massively multiplying in the first six months of life. And that goes on for many months or even years, depending on the brain area that we're talking about in the human brain. And it's followed by a period of synaptic pruning. Because this process of synaptogenesis results in an excess number of synapses. So young children, early in life, young animals, their brains contain more synapses, more connections than the adult brain. So you need this second process of synaptic pruning to eliminate excess synapses. So synaptogenesis is followed by synaptic pruning. And synaptic pruning, while it's genetically pre-programmed to a certain extent, it is also, to a certain extent, dependent on the environment that the animal is in. So we know that synapses that are used are strengthened, and synapses that are not used because they're not needed in that particular environment the animal is in is prune, are pruned away. And that effectively, that process of synaptic pruning, pruning away excess synapses that aren't useful for that particular environment, effectively fine-tunes brain tissue according to the species-specific environment. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example from uh, the developmental psychology literature on learning language sounds in the first nine months of life. So this, um, this area of developmental psychology is thought to depend on this process of synaptic pruning, although actually there's no direct evidence for that. But let me just give you the example. Okay, so we know, for example, that Japanese people find it impossible or very difficult to detect the difference between distinct R and L sounds. And that's simply because the Japanese language doesn't contain distinct R and L sounds. So Japanese babies aren't exposed to those distinct sounds in their first nine months of life, and they lose the ability to distinguish between those sounds. So if you test Japanese babies being brought up in Japan before the age of nine months, they can detect distinct R and L sounds just as well as any English speaker can. But because they're not exposed to those sounds in the Japanese language, the idea is that the synapses that would be used to process those distinct sounds are simply pruned away because they're not needed. They're wasting the brain's resources, so the brain may as well eliminate them. So one question is, um, can you relearn sounds after the first nine months of life? And by the way, of course, this is not Jap just Japanese babies. It's, um, we, we're, there are many sounds in many different languages which, for example, English speakers are no longer able to detect over the first nine months of life because we're simply not exposed to those distinct sounds in the English language. But can we relearn them? The answer is yes, and the experiment uh, was done by Patricia Cool at the University of Washington in Chicago, who took uh, groups of nine-month-old American babies who had never been exposed to Chinese Mandarin and therefore had lost the ability to distinguish between certain Mandarin sounds at nine months. So she trained different groups of, uh, of, of American babies uh, to learn Mandarin. So the first group were exposed to a real native Chinese speaker, just, just a few um, minutes a day for about five weeks, in total about four hours of exposure to a real-life uh, native Chinese speaker, playing, reading, that kind of thing. The second group was exposed to exactly the same Chinese speaker and exactly the same content of Chinese Mandarin, but via a movie, so no real-life social interaction. And the third group were exposed to exactly the same content and duration of Chinese, but via a soundtrack, so just, just via headphones. And these are what the data looked like. So she recorded how well babies at nine months can distinguish between two Mandarin sounds, which, by the way, to most of us sound absolutely identical, because unless you were exposed to Mandarin in the first nine months of life, you won't be able to distinguish between those sounds. So um, native Chinese babies at nine months are really good at distinguishing between those sounds, performing about 70% correct, whereas American babies who have never had any exposure to Chinese are very poor, performing around chance, around 50-50. Okay, so then we, well, then we come to the data from the three training groups of babies. So the, the group of American babies who had been trained with a real-life Chinese speaker improved. They relearned those Mandarin sounds, and they were performing at around the same level as a native Chinese baby. So they, in fact, completely relearned the ability to distinguish between the sounds that they had previously lost. However, another interesting uh, finding from this study was that 
being exposed to a video and being exposed to the sounds of the Mandarin language made no difference at all. There was no relearning in those two groups at all. So this study shows that firstly, relearning is possible after this nine-month kind of critical period is over. But it also shows that social interaction with a real live person seems to be a critical and constraining factor for this relearning. Um, the question is why, and there are many different reasons why social interaction is so important. For example, it perhaps is more motivating, it, it's more interesting for babies to interact with a real life person than just to watch a DVD or whatever. And all, another possibility is that it, it's because when you're, when you're actually interacting with someone, both the teacher and the learner can kind of pick up on subconscious cues about what the other knows and doesn't know. So for example, the teacher can pick up on what the child needs to know, what they don't know, and the learner, the baby, can pick up on what the teacher is intending by, for example, looking at an object or pointing at an object. And that ability to read other people's behavior in terms of underlying things like intentions and other mental states is what is called theory of mind. So theory of mind is, is defined as the attribution of mental states. So the, the, the ability to attribute things like intentions and beliefs to other people and also to oneself. And it's thought that uh, an understanding of joint attention, so for example, following eye gaze, knowing that if I look at a certain object, then I'm interested in that object and I want to direct your attention to that object, and similarly with pointing to objects, develops really quite early on in life, so certainly within the first year of life. So probably babies are picking up on that kind of cue uh, when they're doing real-life social interaction. And there are many other steps of uh, theory of mind development in the first four years of life, culminating, it's believed, in the ability to understand false beliefs. So false belief understanding is a bit like this. So if I, if I hide my water bottle in this box over here, and I go out of the room, and then what, someone from the front comes, picks up the water bottle, and hides it in a drawer here, when I come back into the room, you will know that I have a false belief about where my water bottle is. I believe the water bottle is still in the box where I left it, and that's where I'll go and search. When in reality, you know that the water bottle is in the drawer where the other person hid it. And that ability to understand that other people can have beliefs that are false and that differ from reality and differ from your own develops, seems to develop at around four years of age, or at least the explicit understanding of that seems to develop at around age four. So recently, people have started to look at the neural basis of theory of mind. And for this, they've used a whole wide range of uh, stimuli. They've scanned people in brain scanners, like MRI scanners, and I'll come back to MRI, MRI scans later, uh, doing, doing various different theory of mind tasks. And I'm just going to show you one. So if you look at the triangles, which I'm just about to, which I'm just about to start moving, you'll see that not only do you attribute mental states to other people, but also to two-dimensional shapes on a computer screen. <laughs> okay, so I heard from your reactions that you not only see these triangles as living like little creatures or little children, but also as having things like intentions, the big one wanting to coax the little one out of the box or whatever it is, and emotions, the little one being scared and then eventually both of them being happy. Now this is very odd because they are, after all, just t triangles moving around on a computer screen. And it shows how, if you like, hardwired the tendency to attribute mental states and emotions is, that we even do it to two-dimensional shapes on a computer screen just because of the way their particular movement patterns appear and the way they appear to be interacting with each other. So if you put people in a brain scanner and you look at uh, the patterns of brain activity that occur when you're watching this kind of animation compared to an animation that involves the same triangles but just moving around randomly, you find activity in what's known as the social brain. So the social brain is defined as the network of brain regions involved in understanding other people, involved in uh, attributing mental states and emotions to other people. And the social brain includes uh, these areas here. So we have dorsal, medial, prefrontal cortex right at the front of the brain in the midline, and then two regions, both sides of the brain, the posterior superior temporal sulcus, or the PSTS, so I'm going to be calling it, at the side just behind the ears, 
and the temporal poles on both sides, slightly lower down in the temporal cortex. Now, the interesting thing about these regions is that it doesn't matter how you get people to attribute mental states in the scanner, whether it's by reading them long stories where they have to think about the story character's mental states, showing them animations like the one I just showed you, or cartoons, or just sentences. These areas are consistently activated in many, many studies. There are probably about 60 studies um, imaging studies looking at the neural basis of theory of mind, and they all show this very consistent, uh, reliable result. So the question then, and the question that we're interested in in my lab, is how does the social brain develop, and particularly during the period of adolescence? So I'm now going to kind of shift gears a bit and tell you about the development of the social brain um, and what is known about it. Firstly, from a, from a kind of histological cellular point of view, the answer is not much. Not much is known about how the human brain develops in terms of things like synapses. So you remember I told you about synaptic reorganization that goes on very early on in development. Well, we know from um, a, a very small number of papers published in the 70s and 80s by Peter Huttenlocker at the University of Chicago that this kind of synaptic reorganization goes on for, many, for much, much longer. It has a much more protracted period of development in the, in the human brain. So Huttenlocker studied post-mortem human brain tissue, and he counted the number of synapses. So if you remember, th these are the kind of synapses that he'd be counting um, in different slices of brain tissue from different brain regions of, uh, different, of brains of different ages. So this is post-mortem human brain tissue. And what he found, if you look at the dotted line, is that in the visual cortex, so that's the part of the brain at the back that processes the visual world, um, synaptic density initially increases, so that's synaptogenesis, the generation of new synapses, until about mid-childhood, and then decreases again through the, period, uh, through the process of synaptic pruning until around age 10, after which it doesn't really change very much. And in the frontal cortex, you have a much more protracted uh, period of synaptic development where you get this kind of waxing and waning of synaptic density throughout childhood and synaptic density in the frontal cortex doesn't peak until around 11 or 12 in other words around the age of puberty onset and then it decreases during adolescence and into the 20s and so what the, the sort of take home message from this research was that at least the frontal cortex of the human brain undergoes very protracted development and particularly undergoes a kind of change in, in terms of synaptic density around puberty with a large amount of synaptic pruning going on in adolescence and into the 20s. So that was, that was how the textbooks were written for many 